my name is Judy Lowe. I am a junior at Gallatin, concentrating in carceral studies. Before I dive into my presentation today, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude for my fellowship advisor, Chase Madar, for his warm guidance, Basuki Nasaya for her patient wisdom, and Mehmet Dark Choglu and Kim Foote for their constant support. Thank you as well to anyone who made this wonderful program possible. So I spent the summer in the Dominican Republic filming a documentary about survival after deportation. My host organization was OBMICA, a human rights think tank dedicated to researching migration issues in the Caribbean. I will first say some brief notes about the issue for those who are unfamiliar. In fiscal year 2018, two thirds of ICE removals were of people with convicted or pending criminal charges. Of the 256,000 people who were deported, 1,769 were Dominican nationals. The deportation regime is a unique lens into how our criminal legal system and immigration system work in concert to define who is American and punish and remove those who are deemed undeserving of such a label and its accompanying citizenship rights. I would go further to say that this phenomenon, increasingly known as crimmigration, seeks not only to define who is American, but also who is human and thus deserving of human rights. Deportees are subject to the mental and physical trauma of a triple tiered punishment regime, incarceration, detention, and deportation. Immediately upon their arrival, Dominican deportees are booked and marked as criminal. The stigmatizing mark of deported criminal shadows them everywhere, and they are confronted with great difficulty finding work and housing, accessing healthcare services, avoiding police harassment, and forging a place in their new communities. Family separation and cultural alienation contribute to high rates of depression, anxiety, and a host of other mental health issues. When I first arrived in Santo Domingo, the capital of the Dominican Republic, I didn't know that I would endeavor on a documentary project. Before arriving, I was informed through correspondence with OBMICA that they were taking on a new research initiative regarding the deportation of Dominican nationals and that I would be assisting two professional researchers over the summer. The first day that I arrived at the office of my host organization, I was shocked to learn that the research initiative had been canceled. You're free to do whatever, the executive director told me. And I was at once granted a freedom that was exciting, but mostly terrifying. It was only many weeks later, after evaluating my capacity and what could be most useful and or impactful, that I finally decided to produce a documentary. The people at my host organization unfortunately could not help me much in regards to resources or research connections on this issue. Luckily, my fellowship advisor Chase knew David Brotherton, the co-author of the book that had largely inspired my project, Banished the Homeland, Dominican Deportees and Their Stories of Exile. David had a few leads for me, and I spent the entire first month in Santo Domingo tracking those leads, sending emails, making calls, having dinners, having coffees, in order to build relationships with people directly connected to the deportee community. Without those connections, I would have been paralyzed in my work. This lesson on the importance of relationships would resurface for me in different ways throughout the summer. As I began to interview people in different neighborhoods in the capital and eventually different cities around the country, I discovered a reality that was incommensurate with the sympathetic portrayal of deportees in the media and existing literature. Those narratives largely depict deportees as pizza eating, football loving, perfect English speaking patriots who made a silly mistake and deserve to be back in their real home, in other words, the United States. That is simply not true. Out of all the deportees I spoke with, not everybody grew up in the United States. Many spent only a few years here. Many people still have children and family left behind here, but they also have large families that they currently care for in the DR. And sure, many deportees really enjoyed their time in the United States and want the option to return, 
but just as many people love and are dedicated to the Dominican Republic. As someone with a multicultural and immigrant background, I deeply understand the complexity of belonging and home. All of this is to say that the deportee community is extremely diverse and does not fall neatly into this perfect narrative of the displaced patriot and that people's right of return should not be evaluated against this criteria. Mobilizing this binary of deserving versus undeserving may temporarily uplift certain people who fall on the right side of the division, but doing so forecloses the opportunity to scrutinize what constitutes those categories in the first place. I believe that the human rights framework, as currently applied, often falls in this trap of organizing people according to a principle of worthiness. For example, many human rights protections are revoked once someone commits a crime. Instead of asserting that those who deserve the right of return are deportees who didn't commit crimes, how can we question the very category of crime in itself? And instead of trying to wedge people into a category of citizenship according to their perceived respectability and innocence, how can we redefine the very notion of citizenship in itself? Currently, I'm deeply pondering how we can radicalize our grounds for empathy and avoid falling back on this politics of deservingness in my documentary. When I applied to this fellowship, I was very wary of selecting this issue since I'm not directly connected to the community of deported Dominicans. I did not want to reproduce the detached, top-down dynamic prevalent amongst organizations in the professionalized nonprofit world. While I was in the DR, I tried my best to engage some of the principles of participatory action research. I had some meaningful conversations with folks I interviewed where they seemed to emerge more aware of their potential and power to build their own movement. And most importantly, I made friendships beyond the researcher subject or documentarian subject relationship. Despite all of this, factors such as my limited time there and my positionality inevitably reproduce the often exploitative relationship human rights actors have with directly impacted communities. At one point in the summer, I was extremely disillusioned with this reality. I vowed never to do human rights work ever again in a personal or organizational capacity where I am not directly accountable in the long term to a base of people directly impacted by issues. Because in those rare moments where I felt that the people I was working with recognized their own power, even if for a fleeting moment, I saw that something powerful could emerge in the horizontal alliance of advocates and the people they advocate for, a potential for that very delineation to be blurred. I'd like to conclude my presentation today with a trailer I put together from my documentary, which I expect to complete by early next year. You'll hear from my friend, Jose Luis Cabrera, who was forcibly removed just under a year ago. He'll speak briefly about his views on deportation, family separation, and the criminal justice system. United States hope my family a lot. And I like the United States. United States good. And, and I I grateful because all my family is there. And I was there. And, and I would lie. They do the right thing with people. Mm -hmm. Do a lot of years, lot of time years, like 40 years, years, 35 years, 10, 20 years, 25 years. What did they put in my family in another country? Mm -hmm. All the family is there. But you, you, you want to deport it then, deport it when they catch the case and, and, and let him go. But they, you put it one people in jail, as a city, $5,000 for email a year. If they may be coming see, it's a 100 city, $5,000. It's about money now. They want to have people in jail because about the budget. It's about the budget now for, for, for the unit. It's not about rehabilitation. It's not about rehabilitation. You know, see, criminal system is, is the only way can change everything is criminal system becoming a new criminal system. 